Welcome back to the Athletes Podcast. This is episode 94 featuring Matt Whistler, a professional baseball pitcher for the Tampa Bay Rays. He is probably one of the most humble guys I've had the opportunity to chat with on the Athletes Podcast. Uh, He did not want to talk about how good he is, uh, not only as a pitcher, but also as a human being. I really appreciate his kind-hearted nature and the way he approaches the sport of baseball and life in general. We had some incredible stories about his time in minor league ball. Uh, He came out of the 2011 draft class with some incredible studs alongside him the brian ohio native dives into his career the ups the downs and everything else in between this is episode 94 of the athletes podcast featuring matt whistler here we go Yeah, I appreciate you carving out some time to come on the Athletes Podcast, man. Excited to feature you, chat a bit more about Matt Whistler, learn a bit more about the the Brian Ohio native. Um, <laughs> tell tell the listeners a bit about who you are. Obviously, right now, a pitcher in the Tampa Bay Rays organization, uh, drafted in 2011 in the seventh round out of high school uh, by the San Diego Padres. Maybe give a little background as to who you are, how you've come to be a pretty phenomenal pitcher in the MLB. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, born in Bryan, Ohio, small town, like 10,000 people, um, northwest Ohio. Most people don't really know where that is. Uh, I'm here been at Toledo. It's an hour west of there. Um, not a whole lot going on up there, but I really enjoyed growing up in Bryan. Um, you know, have, probably most of my friends are still, you know, from that small town. But, uh, yeah, I grew up there, drafted in San Diego um, the first time around, and then kind of just went to work there. Uh you know, kind of made my way back up since then. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm coming up, I guess, as a kid, played multiple sports, played soccer, basketball, baseball. In high school, just played basketball and baseball. Um, it's honestly, as I've learned, kind of getting into the higher levels and talking to guys that have, you know, come from bigger cities, it's I'm obviously very blessed. And I came from a small town because it was easy for me to play multiple sports. I've learned some mm-hmm. guys that it's hard for them to do it because the seasons overlap, especially in Ohio. The season's kind of – control themselves, which was kind of nice. The fact that football went into basketball, which went into baseball rather than like teams in Florida starting like baseball in February. I'm like, man, like (laughs) like two games a week, that doesn't sound like that fun. So um, I honestly really enjoyed growing up in Bryan. Um, My family's basically out of there now, but other, I still have some friends and stuff there that I'll go back and see, but, and then coming through the minor and stuff. Yeah. I just went to San Diego and and, uh, put in a lot of work in the first couple of years and, and made kind of a name for myself, um, in their system and then got traded away in, uh, 2015 and then made it up, uh, with the Braves and then started for a couple of years and then started going up and down and then fully transformed into a reliever in 2019, uh, trying to find a uh, stable home, been up in the big league since then, which has been great, but, um, uh, <laughs> obviously bouncing around a little bit's not the easiest of things. Yeah, you're just t- testing the waters, seeing what cities you like, you know, know finding out finding out where you want to have that at home. Cool. Yeah, exactly. Um, I actually want to touch on what you started off with about playing multiple sports. I think that's such an interesting topic of discussion. Athletes nowadays are trying to specialize so early. Parents are like, yeah, I want my kid to play in the MHL, MLB, start them at like four or five years old. When in reality, I think there's actually stats to prove this, that you know, the more sports you play at a younger age, you actually develop better knowledge around your body, the mechanics, whatever it is. Uh, and you end up performing better at your sports later in life. What did you, what positions did you play uh, in those sports? And maybe what were the ones that maybe helped you the most now looking back? I think like they all kind of combine. I mean, if you really think about soccer, I mean, you're using basically, basically all your legs. So, I mean, you're getting a lot of your foot coordination down, you're getting uh, you got to run a lot. So you're getting your cardio and stuff and endurance built up from a younger age. Um, as soccer, I stopped playing in, in eighth grade. Um, but it was mostly, I was forward for a while and defender as well. Like I played pretty much all over for soccer. Uh, but I think like, I wish, I mean, I really enjoy playing soccer. I'd like to one day, my wife and I want to join like an intramural type soccer league around our area. It'd be fun. Um, nice. But- I think that's a big one for your footwork. I mean, your foot skills are really important. I think having that kind of stuff for your coordination with your feet um, and just being in shape. And then basketball, um, kind of play the one through three positions where I would, you know, take the point guard, but also be the, the guy coming off the wing. Um, I played that from a young age through high school. I, I, 
that's one sport too. I'm also looking forward to intramural stuff. I, I miss playing basketball. I still shoot hoops every off season. Okay. Um, I think, especially now, cause like playing the one sport, like you just forget how to be athletic sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. Especially with both stuff like pitching, you can get too mechanical. Your body can just kind of get a little bit stiff. So I, I like the trying to do other sports and stuff. Not that baseball is not an athletic sport, but sometimes you just get robotic rather than doing multiple things. I think having multiple sports gives you more of an outlet just to be an athlete. Um, and sometimes you just forget that that's as simple as it needs to be. And, and you overthink, especially once you get to a higher level, you just overthink the mechanics and you get robotic. So I think doing other athletic activities that you're not so concerned about the mechanics of, uh, like for me going and shooting hoops and just dribbling a basketball and, and doing that type of stuff keeps me, you know, the rhythm and stuff like that a lot better. And, um, Hopefully I'll continue to do that the rest of my life. Yeah, hundred percent. Definitely got to get into those intramural games afterwards. That's, that's the best, best part of relationships, right? Uh, the, you talk about mechanics and like, man, pitchers, actually the sport of baseball in general, after doing research for this episode, I'm like, man, they have so much data. You guys are looking at everything, yeah. analyzing crazy amounts. I know in the minor leagues, you liked using your change up a lot. And then once you kind of came to the majors, you became super slider dominant mixed in that four seamer uh what made that change did you just start seeing success with the slider was it a transition to the big league hitters like what what kind of attributed to that yeah i always had a pretty good slider um honestly Nasty. if i would yeah, be <laughs> i was starting i would have thrown it more um i kind of wish back then like it wasn't as consistent as it is now i think i've found obviously a much more consistent slider now but um it just kind of came about the last couple of years we're leaving because, you know, as a starter, obviously you're not going to sit there and throw as many sliders as I do now, but um, I wish that I would have been closer to 50, 50 with my fastball and breaking balls. I, I wish somebody would have shown me the data of like, Hey, here's where your fastball plays. Here's where it doesn't, um, you know, I wouldn't have thrown two seams to lefties. I just would have thrown them into righties. And I think that would have helped me a ton with sliders, but I definitely would have pitched a lot differently. And, and I got beat a lot starting because, you know, it was basically that old adage of if I go 1-0, 2-0, I'm coming right back in with the fastball. And, you know, a lot of times I would get hit pretty hard doing that rather than like, all right, I get 1-0, let's flip the slider back in there, get back in the count, now I'm even, and now I can kind of go. So um, it's just come about now. And, and obviously, as a reliever, you're coming in, you're facing potentially one to maybe seven, eight hitters um, on a high, high day. So mm-hmm. you're just trying to get out there and, and get out as quick as possible and, and use your best stuff. And for me, my best pitch is a slider. Um, so I'm going to throw it. I mean, it's basically the same as guys that have great fastballs. They're going to throw yeah. all their fastballs. So for me, it's just different because my best feel is with my slider now and, and it's my best overall uh, producing pitch. So it's like, why not throw it more? Yeah, that's a, it's a good point. You know, you got to stick with what's, what's working and don't fix yeah. what's not broken. Right. Um, when we had Brad Keller on uh, the pod episode 70, we talked about kind of the mental hurdles that come with being a pitcher, uh, also related it to the sport of golf. I don't know if you play that as well, but, yeah. uh, okay, there we go. We'll have to get around out of the three of us. But one of the things that we talked about was like how mentally difficult it can be if you get lit up for a homer and then coming back and throwing that next pitch, um, how do you go about the mental aspect of the game? Uh, and I know you just talked, touched on the data, you know, you wishing people kind of told you a bit more about that, but are you mentally resetting after every pitch? Is there, he talked about looking at specific areas within the ballpark that kind of reset him. Do you have any things that you'd use to kind of reset your mind? Yes. I mean, uh, that was probably the, my, I mean, it's still something I overcome now, but mental, I think that was a lot of doubt used to come in starting. Um, I didn't really learn how to slow the game down, all that stuff, and focus pitch to pitch. I, I've had some struggles, obviously, in my career with the mental side, and um, obviously everyone still deals with it, um, you know, especially getting re- released and traded, you know, five or six times, seven times, whatever it is now in the last couple of years is not easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've started, honestly, using – you know, our social, our like sports psychologist people, uh, I talk mm-hmm. to them, uh, when I need to, to get some stuff out. Um, I started meditating a couple of years ago, doing some transcendental meditation that my uncle really tried to get me on. And I've, I've really enjoyed that. So I do that every day before the game and nice. that kind of helps my mind to be in a good spot going into the game. Um, and then I've been able now, I just kind of found myself now finding better headspace on the mound where like, I'm not so concerned about anything, but that pitch that I'm on right now. Um, mm. I've really tried to do a better job of, you know, the only thing that you can really control is that pitcher throwing. 
Um, and just focus on that one pitch and trying to figure out and then analyze that pitch, you know, is it a strike, is it a ball? Obviously, what am I going to do now? What did the hitter do? Um, you know, if there's any slight adjustment that I need to make to make a better pitch, um, but do it quickly and then just go on to the next pitch and just try to execute it. I think that's been a good thing. And then trying to find that, for me, it's it's been trying to find that uh, mental routine too of like getting my work in every day, um, mm-hmm. you know, really making sure that I'm feeling good every day. And that kind of leads into, all right, I feel good physically. I can do this mentally as well. Yeah, it's well, and you touched on having the team support it, whether it's the psychologist, whatever. We always talk about misconceptions that come from, you know, being in the big four, or being in the MLB, NHL. Like, you know, it looks like rainbows and daisies when you're watching it as a fan. But, you know, for you guys, it's your job. You got to show up day in and day out. There's no, you know, quote unquote days where you can go off and just do whatever you want because you got to show up and perform. Uh, what are some of the changes or differences from that minor league change to going to the majors? Like, obviously there's a huge jump. You don't have long ass bus rides or whatever it is, but uh, are the added benefits that come from playing in the major leagues within, I know you've touched on, you've maybe worked with five, six, seven different organizations. Is there a ton of support there that you guys get from a psychological psychological standpoint or from training, rehab, et cetera? Like, is it just night and day? Uh, there's definitely more to do. There's just more people. Like in AAA and stuff, yeah. I think teams have become a lot more aware of, especially the mental side, I think. Like, I think more teams are using, you know, psychologists all the way through the levels, trying to do more to focus on mental health. Um, I think it's just kind of come to light. I think a lot of it too, social media driven, obviously you have a lot of people that just, you know, bad mouth people on Instagram and stuff like that. It's, uh, I think that wears on some athletes. And I think just the media in general now, like there is a lot more stress. That's, that's the biggest jump. I think you realize from the minor leagues to the big leagues. It's like in the minor leagues, like if you go out there and have a bad outing, like nobody knows besides like you, um, mm. so you don't really know about too much, but in the big leagues, obviously you get people, everyone sees what you're doing up here. Uh, there's much mm-hmm. more spotlight on you. It's not like, you know, I'm not even a big name guy, but still like you're out there and um, you're performing in big games and, and high level situations and stuff. You're going to have a lot more you know pressure on you. And um, it's just a different animal in the big leagues. I think the stress level just immediately goes up because the pitches mean more. It's the highest level. The games mean more. Um, so it's handling that stuff. I think was a big jump that a lot of guys, you know, it's, it takes a while to adjust to it. For sure. Bro, uh, just to just to clarify, you are a big deal. Uh, you're pitching in the major <laughs> leagues and you're nasty. Like, dude, I was watching some highlights. The San Francisco Giants, there was a crazy amount of fans that were so excited when they signed you last year. So, um, yeah, be a little. I know you're trying to be humble. You know, you're trying to make sure you're you're a humble guy. I've seen some of your other interviews and you uh, definitely don't talk yourself up. But I think that's something that you know, make sure that you're, uh, you're giving yourself the credit that you deserve because you've got some incredible stuff. I mean, that 2011 draft had some studs in it. Garrett Cole, Trevor Bauer, Anthony Rendon, Lindor, George Springer, Blake Snell, who's on your team now. Um, I'm curious for you now, having played in basically every park within the MLB, do you have a favorite park to pitch at? That's tough. I actually, um, I would say San Diego is probably definitely a top one. Um, that's a really cool park. I actually really like Oracle Park. Um, oh, right yeah. off the stuff, it's really beautiful. If you go sit up top, you can kind of see out into the bay, which is really nice. Um, Tropicana, it's not the nicest of stadiums, but I actually kind of like it for the fact that it is like – it's temperature control, which is great. So you just you just go out there to sweat and you're comfortable, but yet it's humid in Florida, so you can sweat. And then, honestly, like you just kind of forget what time of day it is. Mm. So you're kind of in there and, and, you know, kind of in a bubble – and honestly, it's kind of nice because like day games and stuff, sometimes you feel like crap and, um, you know, you just kind of forget you're in a day game and you're not really worried about it because it just seems like another day there. Um, there's honestly, there's not really too many parks. I would, I mean, like Oakland's not a great stadium you got to go play in. Um, <laughs> for the most what do you part, think like, of the, what do you think of the Rogers Center? Uh, it's cool. I mean, it's, yeah. like Canada's a, uh, if you've ever been to Toronto, it's a great city. Um, yeah. I've really enjoyed my time visiting the Rogers Center. It's, I mean, it could probably be a, like a little updated, but other than that, like it's a cool, it's a cool vibe. I mean, they got good crowds up there. Toronto loves their baseball. So the atmosphere and stuff's really good. And obviously they're really good this year. So um, I'm looking forward to getting back up there into Canada and playing yeah. them. 
much better than Buffalo. So <laughs> <laughs> definitely we're up in uh, Ontario. So that's why I ask. So I'm getting, you know, mixed reviews on the Rogers center. So I'm always curious what guys think. Uh, it definitely could use an update. It'll be interesting to see what happens if they tear know. it down, update, whatever happens. Tough, tough situation. I'm glad I'm not in charge. Uh, at 21, you were playing for the Fort Wayne tin caps and just recently the fort wayne comets just won the echl's kelly cup and was hockey a big thing down in fort wayne when you were pitching there um it's not like a i don't think it was a big thing but i think like the, the fort wayne community actually does a really good job of supporting all their teams uh for mm-hmm. being in my city like it was for a low way city it was probably the best low way city you could play in they came out and supported really well and i think they do the same thing for the comets i mean i I grew up an hour from Fort Wayne, so I'm pretty sure we went to a couple of Comets games when I was younger. Uh, just okay. to go, you know, obviously it's minor league; it's much cheaper to watch. So, yeah, go watch the hockey players and stuff. And I know uh, that city does a really good job of supporting, you know, their their team. So I think they get pretty good crowds over there. And I'm sure for those hockey players too, it's probably a pretty great city to to come down and play if you're going to play in the minor league hockey. Yeah, they've got some crazy fans. We just had Ben Boudreau, who's the head coach, on, and uh, he was telling us some pretty crazy stories about Fort Wayne. So definitely a city we got to go visit. Um, you know, you you mentioned the social media side. You mentioned about like how you could show Tropicana Field sometimes feeling like crap, but you you know the weather can dictate you can feel better after. How do you handle that media that comes in? Like, are you blocking out Instagram? Are you turning it off? Are you like? Because I'm always curious from uh, you know average person's perspective like you have hundreds of thousands people under the scope 24 7 that are analyzing what you're doing how you're pitching you know what you're eating for breakfast that morning do you have to kind of take a step back and manage social media or you know work through some of the things that maybe using it at specific times like how do you how do you handle that yeah i mean i just try and not really pay attention to it you just know after a bad outing you're gonna have some people in your comments and dms and stuff um i think the worst part is the fact that they go after families i think that's really annoying to me that my wife gets a lot of messages and comments um, really yeah i think that's that's the point where like i just don't understand why people you know why are you blowing up families one thing yeah. to blow up the, but it's another thing to blow up families um and it's not just obviously my wife like all the wives seem to get dms and stuff which i think that's probably the worst part about you know the instagram stuff mm-hmm. um but as for me, I mean, you just know you're going to have comments, stuff like that. You just try and not pay attention to it. Um, I don't really post a whole lot that much anyway, just because I don't, I mean, I just don't feel like getting a bunch of comments and stuff on there. So yeah. I don't post a whole lot. I just kind of go on there and get updates, stuff like that, um, kill time. And then, uh, I mean, I try to use it to get, uh, you know, some stuff out of it. Having, you know, I don't have a whole big following, but enough to where like some companies are willing to send some stuff. So I try to use it for that and uh, just kind of like, use it for like just posting pictures of like stuff that we're doing. Um, yeah. But I don't really post, I'm not one of those guys that's on it, you know, posting stuff 24 seven and, and making a huge deal out of it. Yeah. That's such a shame that like your wives are getting DMS from guys chirping. Yeah. Because that's uh, obviously yeah. if they're, if they're taking the time out of their day to give you heck <laughs> for your performance, they are in a terrible state in their life. So uh, that's what I like to keep in mind if we ever get negative comments, because, you know, everyone does. People don't like the fact that they see other people and they're doing stuff that's fun, exciting. They're succeeding yeah. in life, you know, whatever it is. So, um, yeah, just uh, that's my that's my two cents on it. But I, you know, one of the notes that I had here is the fact that your first big league strikeout came against Curtis Granderson yep. in the Mets. How exciting did that feel? Talk me through some emotions from that, because you also when eight innings only allowing one run like pretty phenomenal season like opener for your career do you want to just go into those feelings what those emotions were like yeah the debut probably went as well as it could have gone um especially you know obviously as a starter and stuff like my whole anxiety is around like getting that first out and you can kind of settle in so i guess getting that first out and getting a strikeout uh getting that out of the way the first at bat uh, in the big leagues was definitely big for me. I could kind of set them into the game a little bit, calm the nerves that, hey, I can get these guys out too. Um, so that was obviously a big out for me. And yeah, obviously to get your first strike out of the way, the first batter you see was cool and against a guy of that caliber. So um, yeah, settle me in and for the game itself. Yeah, I mean, everything pretty much went as, about as well as it could be. Um, the way the game ended up, stuff like that, going eight innings and then 
you know, us coming back in the eighth inning and getting that win uh, was pretty special. It was probably one of the cooler, probably top two to three games of my career that I've ever had. So uh, it's definitely a good memory. And, and yeah, it's fun to look back on and, and think about. Okay, so we've we've covered your maybe top three memory. Uh, do you have any bad memories that you want to share or maybe some mishaps that uh, you can laugh about now looking back? Yeah, I've, I mean, I've had plenty of clunkers out there. <laughs> uh, you know, I had basically, it seems like my career's come down to about two or three bad months worth of pitching. Um, yeah, it's really killed me in some areas. And I think, yeah, looking back now, I'm like, man, how the heck did I do that for a month straight just getting struggled? Uh, so... Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of laughers in there that I'm just like, I don't even know how that happened. <laughs> like, so I have too many outings. That's why I'm in the bullpen now is because I had too many bad outings to start. Can you, like, attribute that to anything specifically? Is there like, a reason that you had those couple months of struggles? Was it, like you said, mental, or was there anything else? I think it's kind of mixed both. I think, um, you know, once I had one or two struggles kind of in a row would kind of get to me, and then I'd put a little too much pressure on it. Um, I think that, um, you know, stuff wise, like mechanics and stuff like that, I think I was, I didn't really understand my mechanics at the time. And I think if I had, you know, kind of learned what I've learned the last couple of years, um, it probably would have made a big difference back then. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think some of it was mental that led into the, the, the physical part of it. Um, and then just kind of, yeah, it's always kind of, I've kind of had those stretches where like stuff just goes wrong for, you know, a couple of weeks to, you know, if I could find a way to shorten that time period to, you know, one or two bad outings rather than, you know, have it leading into five or six bad outings and then having the good one that gets me out of it. But by the time you've had that many bad outings in a row, you know, it's really tough in our game to, to battle back from that because, uh, you know, one or two bad outings as a starter can last you for a month of good pitching. And as a reliever, you know, two or three bad ones in a row. And that's, you know, you're looking at two two months of, of good work to, to mm -hmm. battle back. And that's kind of how the start of my season went this year. I just had a really tough start to the season. And then I've basically been battling, you know, for all my numbers, stuff like that, to, to even out. It's gonna it's taken me pretty much until this point to have any chance to, to get it back to normal. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's baseball, 162 game season, but you just gotta be consistent day in and day out. Yep. It's one of those, it's crazy. I uh, I remember kind of looking at stats, you're like, man, they can Go. They can paint the wrong picture pretty quickly if you don't have a couple of good outings. Um, yeah. I, I'm interested what your experience was like being drafted out of high school. You considered going to Ohio State. We have a lot of younger athletes listening to us. Our goal is to educate and entertain the next generation of athletes. And one of the big questions always, especially now with name, image, and likeness being around, but how was that decision made for you? Did you have people who were influencing you? What kind of went into that decision? I'd love for you to, you know, dive deeper into that. Yeah, the decision, it wasn't like an easy one, but it was kind of, uh, you know, I didn't really have any college stuff happening until my sophomore year of high school. And then it was kind of like, okay, maybe I can go to college. Um, and then by junior year, I obviously solidified the fact that I was going to go play D1 somewhere and uh, in my area, I really recruited like in North and like the surrounding areas around there, those colleges and stuff knew who I was, uh, but the bigger colleges, obviously down South, they got plenty of talent down there. Um, so that was solidified. And then my senior year, I guess, you know, playing a couple of East, like a couple of showcases and stuff um, in the summer of my, after my uh, junior season, going into senior year, there was some more draft, you know, stuff around there. And I showed well in a couple of showcases. And then we talked to a lot of scouts that off season, um, it was a tough decision for sure. I mean, I, I didn't have a great senior year. Um, not great, but I had like, I had a bunch of scouts in my first game and, and didn't really throw very well that game. And by the second game, I'd lost all but like two teams. There's only a couple teams interested. Um, but we had talked some scouts and I guess looking back now, it's kind of, I don't really know what I would choose nowadays. Cause like, as you, you know, like when I saw an article a couple of years ago that like I was one of like four high school pitchers to actually get up and make 150, 150 innings in a year, mm -hmm. you know, within like the last like five years. So like the high school guys just hadn't, you know, pitched as well. I think nowadays kids are coming out of high school way better than they used to be though. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got coming out of high school now that are pretty fully developed that I'm like, geez, man, like I was not that good in high school. So, um, Looking back, I'm not, I, I think I was still in the same decision because obviously it's worked out so far, but 
Mm-hmm. It was a tough decision, and I think a lot of it was we thought it was best for me to get into pro ball to pitch this style of pro ball and, and get under, you know, pro coaching and, and learn the pro game from the minor leagues. And I thought that, you know, I was ready enough, mature enough to handle my own. Um, you know, I think that's the big decision you have to look into is are you ready to be on your own and take care of yourself? Um, obviously, I got a decent signing bonus, but nothing like the first rounders get nowadays. So, mm-hmm. um I wasn't a first rounder, but obviously like I got enough where I could live on my own for a while without stressing about it. And I think that's a decision too. You have to figure out if you think you can better yourself in college, especially if you can make money nowadays in college, you don't have to stress about that part as much. Um, But figuring out if you're ready mentally and, you know, to go there because you can't go back to college and play and redo it. You got to go there and that's your career. And are you willing to, to do that from that age and, and miss out on some of the partying and some of the college experience and, you know, playing college baseball and doing all that stuff. Are you ready to, to leave that stuff behind and, and go play and be serious? Cause it is your career. And, you know, at 18, 19, 20 years old, you're, you're going to be, you know, playing long summers and long, long bus rides and not getting treated the best, the best, like you would at some big name colleges. So um, basically you're willing to sacrifice that, but to go out there and, and you know, do it for your career. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you had uh, some fun stories going through the grind that is minor league ball. Uh, any stick out in particular? I know when we had Brad on, he talked about, you know, five guys living in one house, scrounging enough, enough money to get a beer pong table, like anything specific stand out for you to that on that grind that was minor league ball? Yeah, I mean, like I said, Fort Wayne was probably the best situation I could have come into my first full year. Uh, okay. That- as good as it, I mean, we had some pretty brutal travel stuff there, but that that league, like that first year, was probably as good as the first year as I could have. I lived an hour away from there growing up, so I was coming to those games as a kid. So it was cool to have that experience. I live with most family that I would just pay some like small rent money to, but like I had a really nice place. Most of the guys that were on the team were living in these like two bedroom, four people in them, kind of like crappy apartments. So I got lucky with that, and our travel wasn't awful in that league because we were like in the central of it. But, I mean, you go into cities, it seemed like the east side of that league was good, but the west side, like Clinton, Iowa, and, like, so like that was probably the, that's probably the worst city I ever played in because it was just, like, you stayed at a Super 8, and, like, I had a sleep on I didn't believe that they were clean, and, like, it was just gross. And then say my, like, the, the one that I grinded the most was probably in the Texas League. We had – I slept there. Let's see, the first one. I first got called up. I didn't know very many guys on that team. Uh, they were they were kind of an older double a team back then and i was like super young um so we i my first thing i knew the couple guys on the team so i moved in with them and i ended up sleeping i just slept in the living room on a mattress for the first you know a couple months of the season and then by the end of the year uh in a three-bedroom place we probably because of all the moves and stuff that happened in double a we probably had eight or nine guys sleeping there for the year <laughs> you know i was paying 50 just to get my own room there and then those days that, that that travel was brutal for that league we our closest trip was two and a half hours to corpus other than that it was like five hours plus on a bus and like we would take one bus from san antonio to the other division which was like uh it was tulsa um two places in our little rock arkansas and some other one in arkansas were like i mean we were driving 12 hours on our off days and i ended up just <laughs> Uh, um, styrofoam mat and I would just try and lay in the middle of the bus <laughs> Taking a long, doubling up 12 hours like was not it so uh, yeah lay in the middle of the bus and just hope for the best damn oh man eight nine guys in a three bedroom that uh doesn't sound like too too much fun but makes you appreciate when you make it to the big leagues and yeah you get all the all the special treatment and you know that's it's interesting because I think that's common with a lot of ball players is that you know, they really appreciate it once they make it to the big leagues, how good they have it now. Um, you want to dive into way, maybe where you see the training and nutrition aspect of a pitcher specifically, because that's one thing I, I mentioned it before, but like pitchers, I think get a bad rep because people just think that you throw the ball fast and maybe throw some spin on it and you're going to get results, right? Like you don't need to work hard. You don't need to go to the gym. You don't need to eat right can you maybe flip the script on those people and explain how you go about your, your daily routine and how you prepare? Yeah. And I think a lot of it too is nowadays, like there's just so many good arms that like you have to do something that's above and beyond somebody. Um, 
and like guys nowadays take care of themselves probably better than they used to. I think that was like the rep that like, you know, back in the nineties and stuff like that, you did have a lot of guys that were overweight and a lot of guys that, um, you know, it didn't look like they were really athletes, but in today's day and age, like there's not a whole lot of those guys. If you're not putting in a ton of hours of work and taking care of your body, like that's where guys either one get hurt or two, they flame out early because, you know, everyone else is putting in that work. Um, for me, yeah. I mean, in season, I kind of do some stuff. I've, I've, as I've gotten older, um, I've tried to like, especially as starting to relieving is totally different. Like starting, yeah. have a routine, you know, you're pitching once every five days, you can, you can generate your routine, whether you want to lift the day after you pitch, two days after you pitch or whatever you want to do, develop and to make your body feel good. But as relieving, you know, you got to be ready every day, pretty much every day, you know, six, seven days a week, you got to be ready to pitch. So I try and just do like an activation type lift every day and, and just work, you know, muscles every day to kind of just get to that point where like, I'm honestly just a little bit tight every day. Um, okay. I don't like to lose. I don't think many guys do. Uh, I just try and get to that point where everything's kind of activated and like a little bit tight. Just so I feel my body a little bit better. Um, I haven't squatted in a while. My hips and my low back are kind of tight. Okay. So I've stayed away from like anything heavy left leg lifting um, and just saving those for the game. I just do some, I probably do 25 to like 40 pushups a day, just trying to get that. And then a bunch of row stuff just to try and get my back activated and a little bit of workout stuff, but um, do that. And obviously core is really important. So you're doing a lot of core. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other, the biggest thing is your arm care. Um, whatever you're doing to get your shoulder activated, doing your scap bands, um, doing your shoulder care exercises, dumbbells, manuals, getting treatment from the trainers, making sure that you're staying loose. I think that's the big thing, like making sure I want to be a little feeling tight, but I don't obviously want to be like tight because that's when you get hurt. And then just doing your arm care, I think the biggest one. And then as a reliever, we don't really run a whole lot, which is kind of nice. Like you just do more sprint based stuff. I mean, there's just no reason to be doing long distance running. You're not, you're going out there for, you know, an inning, maybe two innings. So unless you're the long guy, there's just no reason to do like long distance anymore for us, which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. Um, for the eating and stuff, yeah, you don't want to be eating crap every day. I mean, it's just not going to be good for your body. Um, like, we have pretty good options here with the Rays. I mean, you have your healthy options. You have We don't really have a whole lot of fried food in the clubhouse and stuff. I try and we get provided juice everywhere, which is really nice. So I try and drink, like, a bunch of juices every day to get some easy nutrients in and then take vitamins and then eat, obviously, you know, your greens and whatever vegetables are provided that day. Um, I've changed my, I changed my diet, I think. I guess like four years ago now, I used to just eat whatever I wanted because I've never had an issue with like the weight stuff. Um, okay. Like my dinners and stuff, when I was are pretty good, but I used to eat a lot more fried food and a lot more dairy and stuff like that. But I've cut out that. I don't drink milk anymore. Um, I've tried to limit dairy. I try to eat higher quality ingredients in the off season. Like in, in season, I kind of just eat what I can as provided. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to be too picky. Just trying to eat the healthier versions I can in the off season. I really enjoy cooking anyway. So, um, but I try to take in, you know, just a smoothie for breakfast, salad or something for lunch. And then um, dinners and stuff, we try to always have like high quality meat. You know, I'm, I'm big into that regenerative farming stuff, trying to find those type mm. of farm to okay. get like the fed meats and like the, the high quality meat, eat less meat, but higher quality. And then um, usually we have a vegetable and some sort of a starch and something like that, but try to eat, you know, what I'm supposed to eat, take care of myself. I drink a little bit, but not like to excess where it's going to bother me. And then just taking care of my arm. And, and that's the big thing is just, especially as a reliever in the big leagues, like you're going to get abused at times and you got to really take care of your shoulder and make yeah. sure you're in your programs every day and getting that treatment. You need to stay healthy. What are you doing for recovery? Is it icing? Are you throwing heat on? Or are you doing, like, what do I'm you do for my sure? Or a, a heat guy. Um, Typically, like my, I start with doing like pre strike, like the, the pre throwing and stuff. You know, I do some scap work to try and get my scaps in a good place, get those activated. Um, like I said, like the activation lifts get my body going. Yeah. But we're, I love sitting in the sauna for like five to 10 minutes every nice. day to kind of wet and lather myself up. Um, I think that really helps a lot. I wish we had that on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if I'm really, I get my hips checked pretty rarely now because like my hips just seem to, to get out of place and getting my body I guess in a good spot every day and that's a luxury we have obviously as 
big league guys is we have five or six trainers that can work on me every day. So yeah. it's a lot hard to get that stuff done because you got one trainer. So the resources of the big leagues are really good. Um, so I try to make sure my hips and stuff stay where they're supposed to be instead of getting out of place. And then by that point, you're just putting yourself in a bad situation. So making sure my body's in a good place. And then um, after games, if I pitch, I've got like a routine that I usually do with arm care. I've got like a, one of those shoulder spheres for my cuff. I either do manuals or dumbbells um, or bands, something like that, just to try and make sure that I'm working my shoulder after I pitch. And then I typically get treatment the day I pitch to try and break down that that stuff and start my recovery process right away. Okay. For the raise, mostly what we do is like the scraping, cupping, and like a little bit of soft tissue stuff. Um, here, here and there, like I'll, I'll do needling, stuff like that if I know I'm down. Mm-hmm. But needling, get, you can get pretty sore the next day, so I get a little hesitant to do it knowing I'm going to be up the next day. Right. Gotcha. Yeah, there's so much that can go into it. It's crazy. And I'm sure it differs between every organization too, right? Like they've got their guy that has specific thoughts and opinions on things. Uh, Matt, take me through, you're in the bullpen, you get the tap on the shoulder, you're going in next inning. What's your routine look like? Yeah. So, I mean, by this time I've, I've hopefully <laughs> been started to warm up uh, typically like, so you know, you kind of gauge it off a of starter, what they're doing. If they're throwing well, you don't have to stress as much. But if they're kind of running some trouble, like you kind of get that feeling of when you're going to need to pitch. Um, I probably start to activate an inning or two before that, getting my hips loose, getting my shoulders going. I try and do a little bit of plyo stuff um, if I have time against the wall just to get my body right. And then as soon as I get tapped, yeah, I'm basically starting to get ready. You know, if I have third out of the inning and we get the call, I'm in the game, basically hop right up um and go through my throwing routine to get myself ready it's basically a couple you know five or six seven fastballs get going as hard as i can and get the catcher down and, and start getting some feel down love it love it i you know, it's always interesting because some guys you know they'll they'll do a little prayer they're doing whatever it is so i'm always interested to hear what people's routines are um can you maybe talk about your parents and how they were able to help. I think one of the aspects that I don't necessarily touch on enough and I want to bring up more is how influential your parents can be in the success that you are or you have as an athlete. And I think, you know, you've talked about them in previous interviews and how integral they were to your success. Um, you want to maybe just give a Coles Notes version of, you know, how they were able to help you? Yeah, they were. I've been very blessed with my parents. They're very supportive, very involved with me my whole life. They're obviously still married. They're going on 40 years this year together. So that's really helped and made it a lot easier. So I've been blessed in that aspect. Um, but yeah, I mean, my we they pretty much are very good about making sure that we put in a lot of work. Um, you know, my dad, we love doing it, but we definitely did a lot of work. I mean, my dad was out with us all the time, doing ground balls, throwing batting practice, shooting hoops. My mom would do that. She would, she was very supportive. She's all the one. They rarely, we had, I had two brothers, I had a brother and a sister, so it was hard for them to be in every single game. But I always, I had a parent, one of the parents probably at 90% of the games in my life, um, you know, growing up. So just having that support, they were always there, always cheering. And then for my uh, my dad, we, I mean, we spent a lot of hours uh, working on whatever we could. He was always available to go. If I wanted to go hit, he'd go throw to me. If I wanted to go shoot hoops, he'd rebound for me. You know, if I wanted to go, you know, get a workout and stuff like that, um, you know, he was always available to go do it with me. Always kind of pushing me, my brother, and my sister to be better at everything we do. Um, you know, they pushed us at school, uh, music, just as much as they did in sports. So they try to keep us, like, well-rounded and everything. Uh, but they were just heavily involved with us, always kind of pushing us to be better. Um, and yeah, I, I have a lot to, to my parents to thank for kind of introducing us to everything and, you know, getting us involved and, and showing us, you know, basically that you do have to put a lot of work in if you want to be good at something and giving effort and not just going out there and going through the motions and screwing around. Like you got to focus in and, and put not only your effort into one thing, but everything you do in life. Yeah, it's so true. I think one of the things I took for granted growing up, and I think a lot of athletes nowadays do as well, is that, you know, you you think you've got it figured out early at a young age, you start performing well, you're like, oh, yeah, I can do this, no problem, you don't have to listen to your parents, they were there, whatever, and you're like, 
Man, that is a ton of wisdom that is at your fingertips, ready to be provided, probably willing to be provided. And yeah. uh, if you if you don't take that in, uh, I think you you end up losing out in the long run. So that's one of the things I really want to start emphasizing now is how important parents and that support network is. It doesn't have to be parents, but you know whoever that network is around you, it can be extremely rewarding to uh, to listen. And I think more than anything, is listening so important nowadays, um, Matt. I, I can't thank you enough for, for coming on, sharing some of your time, your insights. Uh, we wrap up every episode by asking our guests what their biggest piece of advice would be to the next generation of athletes. And, you know, you've provided a ton of information, but I think from someone who's spent some time in the majors now and developed a solid name for yourself, despite your, uh, your wavering and humble nature, uh, can you maybe give your, your biggest piece of advice? Yeah, I would say it comes down to basically take care of yourself, take care of your body. Um, that work is going to need to be made. There's Everyone else is going to be willing to do it. Uh, <clears throat> I would also say, I mean, just be a good person to other people. I mean, that's like mm-hmm. a big thing for me. I've noticed, like, I think I've gotten some extra chances because I'm not like a mess in the clubhouse. I'm not going to cause issues. Um, I think you get a lot more opportunities when you don't burn bridges. You know, you go out there and you treat your teammates right and guys are going to cheer for you and want to help you. Uh, I think that's a big thing in baseball and um, just be true to yourself. You got to stay believing in yourself. Um, that's the biggest thing. Like for me, I've realized that like, no matter what, like you got to trust that you're good enough. Um, you don't have to show it off the field, but on the field, you have to have that belief that you're going to be, you're better than somebody, you're better than whoever you're facing. There is no fear, you know, when it comes to performing. And, and I think for me, like, don't be afraid to fail. I mean, I've that's the one thing in sports it's hard sometimes I fear failures has held my heart held me back a little bit at times um don't be scared of it it happens to all of us like nobody's gonna be mad at you if you fail as long as you gave effort and yeah I mean enjoy yourself have fun enjoy the journey enjoy the process more than the results sometimes and then yeah I mean just be around enjoy your family friends and and just you know, enjoy life and don't stress too much about it. I know it's a job and it's hard and it's easier said than done because I do it still, but <laughs> just enjoy it. And because and we're not, you know, we're not going to do it forever. Yeah. Matt Whistler, I sincerely appreciate it. Appreciate this again. Uh, I'm excited to watch you in the Tampa Bay Rays continue to see some success this year. I'll be watching. I'll, I'll cheer for you. Maybe not your squad, but uh, I look forward to keeping in touch and I'm sure we'll get a round of golf in with uh, Brad here in the near future. Perfect. Look forward to it. Take care, brother. Have a good one. Thank you, folks, for tuning into the 94th episode of the Athletes Podcast featuring Matt Whistler. The Tampa Bay Rays pitcher provided some incredible detail. I hope you folks enjoyed this episode. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Thank you again to Matt for coming on. If you enjoyed this episode, watched it on YouTube, listened to it on Spotify, hit that like, subscribe button, whatever you got to do. We appreciate it. Jordan. Maslin, our producer, really appreciates it. Ian Singleton, it's debatable. I'm David Strike, your host. Thank you, folks, for tuning into the 94th episode featuring Matt Whistler. Bye.